Central.com, and it's time for us to check in with somebody who I've uh, been very, very pleased to be connected to uh, via a mutual friend and someone who appears in the documentary that we'll be talking about uh, at this juncture. His name is Travis Brown, and he is uh, a documentary filmmaker, a filmmaker in, in general. He's a writer, a director, and an editor, too. He lives in Portland, Oregon. He's been in the film industry since about 2010, and he's filmed and edit, edited live events, commercials, promos, music videos, feature films, and a whole lot more. And one of his passions is philosophy, and he's a skeptic and a free thinker, as I imagine many of us are. And the majority, majority rather, of his personal work focuses on the ubiquitous problems of dogma, faith, and credulity. Now, you can imagine these are things which are very much in the focus of modern politics and society. And it is for that reason that I'm extremely pleased to speak to him tonight. His latest work is something called The Work, the Work Reformation. And The Work Reformation is all about the origins of woke ideology. And it helps, hopefully, for people who don't know anything about that, it'll help you to understand where it comes from, advice on how to push back against it, and it will be released uh, early in the summer in America on um, his website, which is thesignalproductions.com. So I'm very pleased to welcome him to the show. Hey, Travis, nice to see you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so so first of all, congratulations on the work. Um, it's a series, so it's not just a one-off documentary. Do you want to just tell us, uh, was there so much material and so much information here that you you, you couldn't do it in one episode? Yeah, well, the, the episodes are fairly short uh, because I wanted them to be digestible and, and easy for people to watch and share around. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's part of the reason. And, um, you know, I wanted to do it episodically so that we could focus on different aspects of the problem. And and and, um, and I hope to eventually turn it into a feature length film uh, as well, like, a, you know, hour and a half or two, long, two hour long film. So um, that that's the goal. It would be uh, remiss of me at this point for anyone watching to not introduce your dog, Nora, who is going to be joining us for this interview. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that, that's Nora. And and you are lying down in case people think there's an optical illusion. You've got some back pain or something, right? Yeah, I have debilitating back pain. I have to spend right. about 90% of my time like this, unfortunately. But um, yes. but yeah, but I've, I've got a great crew that helps me out and, and I'm able to keep going. So I'm grateful. So, Travis, you, you're you're a filmmaker anyway, and you would have found interesting subject matter, I'm sure, no matter what. But but what brought about your interest in in woke ideology and and that as subject matter, particularly when you knew, in the world of entertainment and particularly in filmmaking, it's going to make you hugely unpopular. Many of the people in that world are huge acolytes of this ideology. Yes, that's that's true. I guess I've always kind of found myself in the un unpopular position. So that's part of it. Um, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian home um, that was pretty intense and very dogmatic and, and full of lots of rules, lots of do's and don'ts. And I very slowly left that behind. And I, I kind of lost a community for a while as a result. And then I moved to Seattle and then Portland, these you know safe havens of leftist progressivism. And I thought I would I thought I would fit in better there. I thought that these people were more open-minded and, you know, they're very liberal. But why I started seeing some of the same kind of dogmatic, reflexive thinking and the in-group, out-group thinking just in a different way um, among people in Portland and, and elsewhere. And, and that was probably back in, you know, 2010, 2011. And then just mm -hmm. as this sort of encroachment of, of wokeness sort of took over the universities and spilled out of the universities and entered popular culture, especially in, especially when Trump was elected, I think it really exploded then. Um, yeah. I, I just felt like I wanted to do, I wanted to chronicle this and, and point out the problems of this, this ideology, because it was, it's very different from Christianity and certain, but, but it was similar to what I grew up with. Um, and so that was kind of my motivation. First of all, just just give me a little more detail on the way you grew up. And you said a fundamentalist Christian household. And and the, the, the thrust of this documentary really is to show people the parallels between the kind of replacement religion that is wokeism. Because for many of these people, they are on the left. They are probably, you know, the kind of people who've grown up in intellectual circles, maybe college educated. They've often left religion behind. 
Right. And instead of instead of moving into a world of kind of secular humanism or you know a general interest in intellectual prowess or in philosophy or any of those things, they've replaced the lack of religion, the God-shaped hole in them, with something that is akin to this. It it requires complete belief, and there are plenty of other things that you could tell me about that in a minute. But just for context, tell us about the way you grew up. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, so it wasn't a typical Christian upbringing. I, I and I didn't really know that at the time because it's all that I really knew. But I, um, you know, we were, was forced to go to a private Christian school. Um, wasn't really allowed to have TV in the home. Wasn't allowed to really have any secular influence at all. Couldn't listen to secular music. Um, just there were so many aspects of it that were just controlled and. I mean, any outside influence had the potential to lead me into sin, right? And so it had to mm -hmm. be kept away and kept at bay. And and my parents and the community at large were just, in, in particular, my parents were just extremely strict um, and in in some ways psychologically abusive. Uh, just in, you know, whenever I had a disagreement, even though I, w I considered myself a Christian and I tried to follow the Bible um, whenever I had a disagreement, I, my dad would quote Jeremiah 17, nine to me, which is the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So I would just be told that any, dif any difference of opinion I had on the Christian faith was, well, I was deceiving myself and my heart was desperately wicked. Um, so <laughs> this robbed me of any yeah. ability to be self-confident <laughs> or, you know, um, it was just, it was pretty harsh. Um, that I'm sure there are other stories I could, I could tell you, but, um, yeah, it was just it was a rather extreme environment, and I just wasn't allowed to think outside of that that box. That you know. and would you characterize that as as conservative or as as uh, orthodox or what word would you use to describe this kind of Christianity? Is it is it also is it a kind of Christianity that that we might be able to recognize? Was it was it evangelical? Was it Catholic? Yeah, it, what, what? it was fairly evangelical. We went to a non-denominational church, um, so there wasn't really a de denomination specifically, but it was very mm -hmm. evangelical. There's a lot of speaking in tongues, glossolalia, a lot of being right. slain in the spirit, um, a lot of that sort of thing. And, you know, fundamentalist, I think, describes it the best. I mean, yes, my, my parents and community were fairly conservative, but that was just sort of the town that we lived in, you know, lot, lots of conservative Republicans, but that doesn't quite describe the the situation I feel like I was in. So, and was this something that you were you were keen to escape from? Uh, your move to Seattle was was intended to to bring you some kind of relief from from this very restrictive, very oppressive environment. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, at first, you know, as I said, I I I, I took it on board and I tried to make it my own and I tried to believe it, but there were certain. You know, my, my parents were sort of Old Testament Christians in the sense of like we needed to consider the Old Testament and how that would influence our faith as well. And there were just so many things in the Old Testament, like God, you know, committing or or um, promoting genocide and that sort of thing that just really mm -hmm. s just struck me as immoral. And I don't know where that came from because I didn't have anyone to tell me that that was immoral. It just it just went against my own innate sense of morality. And I just slowly started to question it and really, um, you know, leave it, leave it behind very slowly. Uh, and then eventually I was happy to discover people like Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens mm -hmm. and realize that, oh, there's, there's no proof for any of this. And I can just relax and be relieved, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just thrilled that you mentioned Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens because both of them had such an enormous influence on so many of us growing up in the late 90s early 2000s when you know the biggest threat in the world was something like Islamic fundamentalism and yeah. with it yeah. there was a huge amount of Christian orthodoxy and you know just the idea that there were people with this incredibly dogmatic view of the world and there were there were shining lights like them and Dawkins and you know there are many others too, but mm -hmm. that these people were, were were saying that there is something good that can exist without religion, and it, religion is not required to make the world good. And I I always thought that these were really smart, really interesting people, to the point where I could consider myself at some point to have been a very unpleasant atheist mm -hmm. going around kind of telling Christians how stupid they were and that kind of thing. And I'm sure you must have felt re relatively similar once you'd broken free of the shackles of your childhood. But 
for many of us, it it really only created a, a bit of a hole. I mean, this is not the case for me, but certainly for many people who decided, well, actually, there's there's no proof for any of this uh, mumbo jumbo. And the Bible's just a book, and the Quran and the Torah are just books. And actually, we can manage perfectly well knowing that there isn't an afterlife. But for some, that wasn't good enough. And they've had to replace that with much more insidious and dangerous things. Sometimes they've replaced it with other religions. Sometimes there is a, a kind of uh, a humanism, which I suppose might just completely render someone free of morals of any kind. Uh, what is your what is your take out? How would you have described yourself some five to 10 years ago when you'd started to move into that world? Yeah, I, well, I, I was initially pretty leery of the atheist movement because it just it seemed almost evangelical to me in a sense. Um, mm. You know, I first read, I think, The God Delusion and God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. Um, and I was much more of an agnostic at the time. I think some of their arguments sort of pushed me more towards being an atheist. But it, it being an atheist is just it's such an uninteresting uh, um, identity, you know, all it means is lacking a belief in the supernatural deity. So it, it's not mm. something I took on board too strongly. Um, but you know, it's, I, I, I went through my own crisis of meaning in my early twenties, having lost my faith and got very close to com committing suicide and then having to sort of rebuild my own structural foundation of, of values and morals and, it's extremely difficult when you when you grow up with a particular faith um, and that's that's totalistic in the way that mine was. And then you have to abandon that and, and build something new. I think a lot of people don't go through that process. Sometimes they just might lose their faith or they might think the parts of it are silly or, or harmful. And then they just kind of drift. And I think that a lot of those people end up grasping on two things like, you know, wokeism or woke ideology, um, because they don't necessarily have a very good foundation themselves for navigating morality and values and that sort of thing. And so it makes them kind of ripe for, for this ideology, unfortunately. Um, and then more at a societal level, I, I you know, it, I think it's true that individuals can be fine without religion and, and live meaningful and productive lives. But it's it's difficult to say you know i'm a little bit more in in the douglas murray and neil ferguson camp even though they're both atheists they sort of lament the the decline of of christianity because of the fact that these new things come in and, and supplement that are as you say more insidious um so i'm somewhere in between you know well, there yeah i think they they almost um they try to supplant the judeo christian infrastructure of western civilization and it's a very difficult thing to do it's almost like asking a an infant to substitute an engineering plan for a city when that city <laughs> right. was over 2000 years by many people who've come and gone since but you know it's interesting that that you've seen parallels between the kind of christianity you were raised with and the kind of religious fervor with which people adopt wokeism. Let's talk about that a little bit because it was obviously, it was so obvious to you when you started making this that you thought I've got to make a, a series about this and I'm going to explain to people who, some people don't even know what wokeism is. They think it's this, it's this made up thing that's far on the horizon that really only happens in places like Portland, Oregon, um, that doesn't really have an effect on civilization as a whole. It's kind of a bunch of you know, left-wing liberals who dye their hair and scream and shout and talk about racism way more than there is racism and talk about gender issues and trans issues. And to them, it's uh, it's distant. Right. But for right. you, it, you, you sensed it was sufficiently close that it would merit paying attention to in the form of a documentary. What are the parallels between wokeism and religion? Yeah, well, just to touch on that, that last point, um... You know, it's I, being friends with Peter Bogosian has helped me sort of see some of some of the parallels and see some of the those more extreme ideas being leached out into society. And I mean, you, if you just think about the way language has changed over the last ten years, people use words that they that they used to not use. You know, systemic being one of them, lived experience mm -hmm. being another. Um, you know, just an everyday conversation, at least around here, 
you can hear people say that, and in the, in the news as well, you hear people say these words that <clears throat> really are, are words manufactured by activists in the university system. And to me, it's right. fairly obvious that, that these ideas are have now proliferated. Um, but in terms of the similarities, uh, you know, there's, there's what you could consider an original sin, you know, Christianity, you have an original sin. We're just, we're just born with it and you find redemption through Jesus. Well, in this particular religion, wokeism, you have an original sin, which is your privilege in particular, if you're white and male and heterosexual, that's a, a sort of a compounding of, of, uh, of the problem. And, the problem is that there's no redemption for that. There's there's no redemption mm. mechanism. It's, it's, what, it's what Hitchens used to refer to as being made sick and commanded to be well. He used <laughs> yeah. to say the essence of sadomasochism. And, yes. and this yes. original sin is something which is inescapable for, you know, even a young white person born 10 years ago. They are, they're immediately, there's a, there's a problem attached to just the fact that they are white or the fact right. that they're right. Jewish or the fact that they're, uh, tall or short or whatever it might be, but mostly this this white thing that you know you carry this burden, and and so original sin as one of those things is is absolutely clearly a parallel. What others are there? Um, I would say the the act of heresy. You know, I mean, when, whenever I would question, as I mentioned, the religion I grew up with, um, it, the word heretic may not have been used, but that but the idea was certainly pre prevalent and. Um, you know, I, I was told that I was evil or wicked or, you know, casting aspersions if if I just if I just question certain aspects of the faith. And the same mm -hmm. thing happens here. If you say, well, I'm not so sure that there is systemic racism or white privilege or even, you know, I'm not so sure that the cops, the cops are hunting black people. You know, these are her heretical statements and you will just be mm -hmm. castigated, you know, called a white supremacist uh, or saying, you know, people will say that you're using far right talking points and things like that. So. There's a kind of heresy and, and, and blasphemy. It, those are kind of wrapped up in, in that. Um, so I'd say that that's another parallel as well. I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that um, I think it's worth giving credit to Douglas Murray. He, I think he drew the first parallels, certainly mm -hmm. in, in, in my awareness of this discussion. He drew the first parallels between wokeism and, and, a, and a religion of sorts. I mean, the dogma, the ideology, the heresy, the original sin, all of those things. And then this, this one-upmanship that the priesthood plays with each other, mm. which is another part of it. And, you know, Douglas probably elucidates this a whole lot better than either you or I could. But it's worth just dwelling on that for a second, that there's a constant reinvention and a new vocabulary being introduced all the time so that you can pip the others to the post and you can be more woke because there's woke, right. woke, right. wokest, and even the most woke of today will be the least woke of tomorrow because there's someone else undermining them as we speak. So you can never be pure enough. You can never yeah. actually be, yeah. you can never be cleansed of any, there's no solution on the table. You know, you, you, you basically have to, to throw yourself down on your knees, beg for forgiveness from gods who are just not willing to give forgiveness. There's never been, as far as I can tell, a single instant of, of forgiveness in anything. It seems that it's an ongoing uh, Spanish Inquisition from which there's no escape. Right. Yeah, it's, it's very puritanical and uh, very self-righteous, which is also something I experienced in the religion I grew up with. And I, I won't I won't put, point anyone out in particular, but there were those people in my life that were very self-righteous and, and very puritanical and you could never be good enough. Um, and, and like you said, there was a kind of one-upmanship um, and, uh, you know, it's, as you say, there's the, you know, there's no, no solution for this, unfortunately. And, um, it's, it's really unfortunate because the people who are perpetrating this, as you say, won't be woke enough tomorrow. And so it's no. a very unforgiving, um, way of thinking and, and a unforgiving ideology, which is just, especially with the advent of the internet and pe the way that people make mistakes online, that's the opposite direction of what we need. We, we need some kind of forgiveness and understanding. And these people are very happy to burn their own uh, witches with, from within their own ranks if those people are seen to, to not be woke enough at any given point. Um, right. It's, it's also interesting. I saw in the trailer for your documentary, you feature Douglas Murray, Peter Bogosian, but you also feature some of the high priests and priestesses of wokeism. I mean, you've got people like Ibram X. Kendi, 
you've got uh, Kimberly, what's it? Grinshaw. Grinshaw. Yeah. You've got uh, the, the woman who wrote White Fragility, Robin DiAngelo. Yeah. These, yeah. these are some of the people who are kind of at the leading edge. Certainly, they're all making lots of money out of being yeah. Uh, yeah. the most woke in the room at the moment. And of course, that, that'll last as long as they can make it last. But uh, did you manage to get any actual interviews of these people or did you just manage to get footage of them doing their talks? Because they're notoriously difficult to draw into debates. They, they know that yeah. their case is quite flimsy. They're not going to sit down with a Peter Boghossian and actually take him on because they'll, they'll know that their argument is going to be found wanting in advance and will avoid that at all costs. Yeah, for sure. And unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to get any of them to sit down. I, I did. <clears throat> I had a, a crew member of mine who has no social media presence and no connection to Peter or myself. I had him reach out to um, African studies and I think maybe gender studies professors at PSU to for a, a real inquiry into you know what it is that they believe. And, you know, I, I approached it by saying, you know, Trump has um has taken CRT uh, under fire and, you know, we would like your opinion on this. And not only did none of them agree, but none of them even replied, um, which yeah. I thought was strange. Um, so no, I, I would love to have someone espousing these beliefs and, and maybe challenge them a little bit or talk to them about it, but they generally don't want to go on. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate. So what are the, what are the holy books of this, of this order? I mean, we know that the, there's this Old Testament kind of adherence to, you know, third wave rather than second wave feminism. There's mm -hmm. a huge amount of, of interest in the transgender uh, situation, mostly because that's the extreme leading edge of, of where you can test people's wokeism. You know, they have, to abandon, they have to abandon all thought of reality. There isn't, there isn't a reality in this. It's socially constructed, and, and most of those must be pulled down. And people can decide to be attack helicopters one day, women the next day, and men the next day. And you've just got to kind of go along with that or you're not woke enough. But the other books are, are, are kind of based around, you mentioned critical race theory. Mm -hmm. There is this idea that Black Lives Matter is, a, is an organization that's really, you know, to the, the casual observer, it's an organization that's interested in justice for unarmed black men being gunned down by the cops, which I think, and again, the term Black Lives Matter is something that's inarguable. Most people right. would say, well, of course, Black Lives Matter. But the organization <laughs> itself is a hell of a lot more poisonous than that. What, is, yeah. what, are, the, what are the nexus, uh, the nexi of, of these various arguments? Where do they all come together? And what are the, what are the main texts that they consider to be sacred? Yeah, it's, it's really challenging because there isn't just one book like the Bible or the Quran. You know, there, there are multiple books, there are multiple articles, um, there are multiple sources of this information being, as I said, leached out from the universities. Um, but, you know, some of the more popular ones would be like How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, also mm -hmm. known as Henry Rogers. Um, <laughs> that's his real name, Ibram Henry Rogers. Um, mm -hmm. There's White Fragility, and now Robin D'Angelo has a new book called Nice Racism. Um, which I won't read. I think white fragility was painful enough to read. Um, and then who, there are, I mean, who is, who is Robin D'Angelo? Because to most of us, she was absolutely in the periphery. If, if at all, even known to many of us, and she's right, really right. like a West coast kind of academic type. And this book was, was nothing sensational in terms of content, but it's become a, a, a major piece of work for, leftists and and they 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 believe it has enormous merit yeah and it's it's one of the most terribly written books of all the anti-racist books that i've read i mean she's mm. just she's a terrible writer she's a terrible thinker just very circular and and absurd frankly um you know i think her book was a bestseller and and what, what was it 2018 um largely because of probably black lives matter and, and other movements but it, it got back into the spotlight in 2020 after George Floyd and, and COVID and the lockdowns and it, everything kind of going to shit. Um, but yeah, she, she's just a, a huckster. I mean, she, she noticed, she noticed racism in herself, actual racism. I mean, she describes it in the book and then she, she pushed that out onto every other person, especially progressives and liberals saying, well, everyone must be like this. And here's what you need to do to expunge this. Although you can't really expunge it, but yeah, um, I was gonna say, so she, she hasn't achieved um, 
she hasn't achieved sainthood herself yet. Well, no, they always talk about doing the work. You have to do the work. The work. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what, is, what is this work? <laughs> it's, 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 it's very vague, but it's often described as just an ongoing struggle, if you're white in particular, um, with your own racism and your own privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's just a constant battle where you have to constantly realize that basically that you're in the wrong and that there are uh, methods through which you should absolve yourself of these problems. You can't fully absolve it, right? But you have mm -hmm. to constantly work, do the work. And um, I mean, it's just, it's it's mind numbing and ridiculous and based on a, on a false premise in the first place. And, and really pointless because there's no real reward at the end of this. I mean, it's not as if, you know, suddenly you'll be embraced and people say, well, here we are, stamp, finally approved, you're not a racist and we can move on. There's, there's it's, it's an interminable state of 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 sadomasochism it's a it's a constant yeah. self-flagellation and um and i suppose for people who have that instinct you know people who do like beating themselves up and people who have a bit of a martyrdom complex uh it's it's probably for them very cathartic and interesting and they find themselves to be uh, absolved one day and 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 back in trouble the next day i, su I suppose there are people who enjoy that sickos you know people who, who are yeah, disturbed yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a constant job, right? And it's yeah. it's it's a way to it's it's a sense of meaning. You know, you get a sense of mm -hmm. meaning from from C, 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 a labeling this a problem, your own privilege or racism, whatever, and then b actively trying to work against it. And so that gives a a person a kind of purpose. You know, it gives them a reason yeah. to to live in a way. Um, and it's interesting. It's it's really it's really for white people to feel again like they're in charge. Because yeah. really, I mean, the, the irony of all of this is it's not as if this has come from, uh, you know, black people are saying, you're racist, you need to improve, here's how we'll help you do it. It's mostly from white liberals who are, again, usurping that power, the power of, <laughs> of racism, ironically, and saying, well, we've got to cure ourselves. It's Again, it's we're so important that not only do we invent this stuff, but we also are the only ones who can cure ourselves of it. Yeah, yeah, my my friend Corey Drayton, who's in the series and uh, happens to be black, calls it saint, the, at least the book White Fragility, sanction white white supremacy. I mean, it, it really is a, a kind of white supremacy in that you know w we're the ones responsible for all all your ills, black people, and we have to resolve them. You know, it's all about us and what we can do, and it is. Yeah, it's nice, just it's nice gross. And patronizing. It's oh, nice yeah. and patronizing. It's great. Must yeah. make black people feel terrific. So, what is what is the overall reaction to the documentary so far? I mean, have you have you had people call you up and say, "Hey, what are you doing here? This is going to ruin your career. You're going to get cancelled. Uh, this is extremely bad for you as a filmmaker." Have you had other people call you up and say, "Thank you for doing this. It's tremendous. It's brave." Yeah, I mean, you know, most of most of the former has been put on myself by myself. I've had just crippling anxiety over the last six to eight months resulting in a lot of lost sleep it's been rather difficult but it's been mostly self-imposed i've just been worried especially living in the portland area with antifa around the corner um it's been a it's been a concern that i've mostly put on myself i mean i've had some people on twitter and elsewhere you know call me a white supremacist or say that i'm just making far-right propaganda but those people have been in the minority it's been overwhelmingly positive i've had so many private messages and and youtube comments and and um other other messages just saying thank you you know i'm so glad you're making this documentary and it feels like you're giving me a voice etc so it's over it's been overwhelmingly positive thankfully i'm glad to hear that yeah. what's it like living in portland at the moment because didn't you guys uh, have some kind of uh <laughs> it was in seattle they declared the autonomous zone but you've pretty much had violence and riots for months in portland what what is yeah. going on there because this is the if there's ever a place in in the united states where the left have a shot of kind of eternal rule it would be in in the pacific northwest what goes on on a daily basis there are, are you facing this stuff daily or or is it kind of also in the periphery well, you know, I I decided to move at the beginning of the year, largely because I'm making this documentary, and I didn't. I was living pretty close to downtown, where there's lots of homeless camping, lots of Antifa. I mean, Antifa has been pretty relentless. I mean, the, really, ever since about June or July of last year, they they found a cause to rally for. You know, roughly 200 people, give or take. 
Um, yeah. And ever since then, they've found something to protest, something to burn down, something to break. And, you know, there was an autonomous zone actually set up. I, I went and filmed it. Uh, it was pretty surreal and fairly scary uh, called the Red House up where mm -hmm. I, I used to live on Mississippi and in a really densely populated part of Portland with sh shops and things. And I remember going there and and seeing you know, it was literally an armed encampment in the city, you know, people with machine mm -hmm. guns, people with barricades everywhere, um, protecting this Red House. Um, protecting these people who were frankly awful criminals who literally beat their puppies and are just terrible terrible people um but they were being evicted because they purposefully didn't pay their rent for something like two years and <laughs> and so then an antifa decided to rally behind them and say well they're black and indigenous and therefore this is systemic racism when no it was just a result of being bad people <laughs> um yeah. But it was really surreal going and filming because I, I got a really long lens and I tried to film from really far away because I knew that they all had radios and they would come after you if, if they saw you. And um, before I set up, I saw people, you know, like a young couple pushing their baby right next to this armed encampment like nothing's wrong and like everything is fine. I mean, it was just it was so bizarre. And as soon as I started filming from a distance of something like 100, 250 yards away, they immediately saw me and then started to come after us. We were set up to jump in the car and leave, uh, but we did. We filmed them at every entry point, and um, and I went there several times and got chased several times. And it was it was just bizarre and surreal. Um, what are and, the what are these what are these people in in an encampment like that? What do they want? I mean, what's for them the ideal existence? Surely that's they can't they can't see this armed encampment and the violent conditions that ensue, or or in Seattle with the autonomous zone. The kinds of, of of you know depredations by members of this cult it's the only way to call it really yeah, yeah. on each other it, that can't be an ideal way to live have they thought it through or are they just <laughs> swept up in the mania i mean what I, what is I it i think they're swept you know i think they're swept up i mean i think that going and doing something like that is again what gives them a purpose i mean they feel mm. like they're fighting this entrenched enemy the, do the they state. not have do they not have enough to do i mean this is i, I don't yeah i don't want to be glib about this but a lot of these are privileged white kids and i don't yes. like the term yeah. white privilege because you know it's very it, to me it, it, it smacks of all kinds of um of, of very obvious stereotyping and and right. categorization of people it's like saying you know something about black people as a whole it's just plain racist yeah. but these are a lot of these people who are in antifa or in the woke movement a lot of these are people who've really got nothing to complain about they have plenty of money they usually live with their parents for far too long some of them don't have jobs but the ones who do have very nice jobs uh they're educated so you can't say they're just stupid and write them off yeah yeah you know it's it's hard to know exactly how the structure is oriented because they claim to be an autonomous uh, movement with no hierarchy, but there's clearly hierarchy. Um, mm. I, I spoke with a dentist who had to shut down her her practice just just outside the red house, and she spoke with with them, pleading with them to let her be able to, you know, do these surgeries that she needed to do on babies and this sort of thing. And and um, you know, they said that they would have to speak to the higher ups. And I, I don't I don't know who those people are. Uh, but they, but this is clearly a well-funded movement. I mean, they had a lot of supplies and weapons, and mm -hmm. they raised something like three hundred thousand dollars for this this you know destitute family in the red house. So there is a hierarchy. I don't fully understand it. I mean, maybe some somebody like Andy No has a better uh, take on yeah. that. But um, but yeah, they often they often are um, well-to-do uh, white kids frankly um and then and then they they and then they loop in like the homeless and they loop in people with mental illnesses because it attracts that kind of person um, right of course yeah well i mean if you're going to get your rent free and these people are going to stand up for you and blame it on racism then you're going to join in yeah yeah you yeah know? absolutely and, and and if you can if you can loot a store or something in the process well that's a bonus you get a tv <laughs> right right <laughs> A so TV that they could probably already afford. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned uh, Andy No, who's really been a very, very brave uh, soldier in the fight against this craziness, and he's he's paid a huge price for it. He's been smashed over the head and had brain damage, and 
You know, he's, yeah. he's taken his own life in his hands a number of times. Are you in communication with him? And, and have you guys spoken since he's also filming stuff and doing a lot in this in this area? Not, not really. Uh, we had something of a little bit of a falling out uh, that I won't go into, but um, I, I filmed some some events for him when he was at PSU uh, with Pete and other people. And so mm -hmm. we we were communicating back in you know 2017, 2018, but um, but I, I I don't really keep up with him. So okay, yeah. Who who do you think are the people who are fighting hardest against this stuff? I mean, you mentioned. Peter Bogosian, uh, you've mentioned Douglas Murray, but there are others, right? There, that's not the <laughs> that's not the the, the 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 numerous clauses of the number of people who can add value here and right. who are who are fighting very hard to bring just common sense back. I even listened to Bill Maher this week, mm -hmm. and he was saying, you know, common sense is what we're missing here, and he's very much on the left, and he's a guy who's been outspoken about how he felt about Trump. And right. he says that the you know the, the the left are really eating their own children here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, there's some other fantastic people I feature in in the documentary series. Nancy Rommelman, a journalist and author, is one of them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Azra Nomani, who's doing amazing work trying to expose CRT in the classroom and trying to defend kids' education. Um, right. I, Ayan Hirsi Ali, I was lucky enough to get in the series um, along with her husband, Neil Ferguson, who's a mm -hmm. historian, brilliant historian. Um, and let's see, and I, I mentioned my friend Corey, and Corey mm -hmm. is, is uh, helping set up a local uh, group for people in the film industry who don't go along with with the woke ideology and who want to find work and, and group together. And I know a number of people like that who are creating these small groups and organizations to to push back and to have some sanity in their their realm of expertise so I'm, I'm encouraged by that well you say you're encouraged so travis is there light at the end of the tunnel because for many people it looks like the internet is just absolutely chock full of twitter mobs of, of woke nutcases who are making it very difficult for people like you and I to have conversations like this, or for ordinary people who are much less well placed in right. in terms of contact right. in the media, people who don't have the resources you have or I have, but just have a feeling that what's going on around them is bizarre and wrong, and uh, many of them may feel the fight's been lost. Yeah, and that's an understandable feeling because most of the institutions and in entertainment and news media has been captured by the woke cult, unfortunately. But uh, I also do see many new organizations, as I mentioned, or even just small groups popping up all over the place to um, give people support. You know, Counterweight by Helen Pluckrose in the UK is one of them. Uh, FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, uh, is another one. Um, so there are... There are people and there are organizations cropping up in new institutions. And I think it's going to take more and more new institutions, in particular colleges of education um, and universities. Uh, but I do think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I just I think it's I think it's a, it's it's not close, uh, but but I do see the, the tide turning um, slowly, at least. Well, no doubt your woke reformation documentary is one of the reasons that we have some reason to hope. And uh, I congratulate you on, on putting this project together. I hope it's a tremendous success. And uh, I encourage everybody to see it, the Woke Reformation. And our guest is uh, is Travis. He's he's the guy who's put it together. It's his baby, Travis Brown. You can find out more by going to The Signal Productions. That's The Signal Productions with an S dot com. The Signal Productions dot com. And you can go and see the trailer. And, uh, and as soon as things are available, then uh, you'll let us know. This is terrific. Well done. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And the, one of the main places that the series lives is on Locals. So if you go to the wokereformation.locals.com, uh, okay. I have not, not only the episodes, but a ton of other content on there um, for, for members of, of my Locals. And um, so I'd encourage people to check that out as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Travis. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me on. It's been great. Cool.